Welcome everybody to a new edition of UFO Man Live. My name is Tim or UFO Man and to my side and uh, is my co-host and my friend Tommy Highway. Tommy, introduce yourself. Hey folks, I'm Tommy Highway. Thrilled to be here this evening. We have a fantastic show for you. We have a wonderful guest. Uh, his name is Matthew, but before we get into that, there's something that we wanted to discuss with our audience. Unfortunately, um, YouTube has decided for whatever reason that they're going to go ahead and demonetize our channel. And what that means is they've cut off all of our revenue sources. Um, and it's for arbitrary reasons. We don't even know why they don't, uh, they haven't given us any explanations, any reasons, any warnings, anything like that. They right. just basically pull the plug on the revenue stream. This has happened several times before. Now right. you folks, you folks come here because you know that we're a very benign channel. We're very family friendly and we get to the truth. I mean, we, we debunk the things that need to be debunked. Um, you know, we're serious about this. this we're, we're like a more harder hitting journalists, if you will, when it comes to the, you follow the, the subject of ufology, um, right. but, but they've done it to us again. So what we're asking at this point, folks, we want to go ahead and take control of our own destiny because YouTube is just, it, it's, it just seems to be like, Whoever is in a bad mood, they can go ahead and just cut off someone's revenue. But we've actually created a Patreon page, folks. Tim's got to put the, the link up right there. That's where you can find us. Um, folks, if you could do us a big favor to support the channel, if you could actually become a Patreon member, we'd really appreciate that. We've got all kinds of fun stuff that we're going to be giving away, um, things that uh, we don't actually put on the channel, some, some very exclusive content. Uh, that'll all be there as well, folks. And that would really help us out if you could, if you could do that for us because uh, – you know, it does take some money to make all this work, to be honest. And YouTube is, we've had it with uh, with the bipolarness of YouTube at this point. Tim? Um, I have to say this about YouTube. Um, YouTube indiscriminately audits uh, all kinds of channels uh, with their algorithm and uh, doesn't give a reason. So the reason that we're pushing Patreon right now is for all the members that have subscribed to the YouTube membership page, who have now lost their membership badge. If you're interested in coming over to Patreon, we have over 48 posts there already. The written word, photographs, and video that is not featured on the UFO Man channel. So if you're interested, come over there. Otherwise, wait the 30 days and uh, you'll get your membership badges back on YouTube. Oh, and, and do us a big favor, if you would, for those of you that are going to be checking this video out after the fact, after it's, it's already gone live and you're basically watching a rerun, um, even though YouTube is no longer going to pay us uh, to actually run their uh, advertisements on our content on our channel, right. they're going to run them without paying us. So do us a huge favor. Um, if you actually see one of those advertisements in the, this, this video, please don't click on it. Just go ahead and ignore it. We would really appreciate that because if they're not going to pay us, then they really shouldn't be running uh, ad content on our show. I mean, come on. Right. I agree with that. Um, I don't want to necessarily boycott the advertisers themselves, oh. but what we're trying to do is make a uh, statement to YouTube because YouTube is indiscriminately doing this. I mean, if they would have given me a reason, something that I could fix, mm -hmm. then um, I would understand. But in this case, they didn't give me a reason. There was no reason at all. So um, just uh, keep your ear to the ground and we'll keep you informed in that regard. Tommy, take it away. Introduce our guest. Folks, we have a fantastic guest with, with us this evening. His name is Matthew Roberts. He's an author. He was a cryptologist on the USS Theodore Roosevelt. He spent 16 years in naval intelligence, and he's very well aware of the gimbal video um, and the sighting as well as others. Matthew, welcome aboard. Thanks for having me, guys. Yeah, you're more than welcome. Our pleasure. Um, before we go into Matthew's uh, segment this evening, we're going to touch upon the story of Gulf Breeze, Gulf Breeze Revisited by Tommy Highway. Take it away, Tommy. Folks, Gulf Breeze has been a hot spot of UFO activity for at least three decades, probably longer than that. Okay, uh, For those of you that are not very familiar with Florida, Gulf Breeze is way up in the panhandle. It's near Pensacola, very near Pensacola. All right. Now, um, 30 years ago, there was a heck of a sighting 
And it was actually witnessed by multiple people. Multiple people actually had VHS video of this thing. Okay. Um, and it was, it, it was like one of the biggest things that happened. It was one of the bigger sightings, at least back at the time. Again, this is 30 some odd years ago. And Tim, you do have a video. I believe you want to sh show for this one. Yes. You want me to show that now? Yeah. Go ahead and let it rip. Okay, I can do that. Yes, I can. All right. This is Ed Walter's story from back in 1987. On November 11th, 1987, Ed Walters tells the story of how he saw a light moving behind pine trees while he was looking outside of his west-facing window. He went out his door and he saw a UFO. He rushes back inside to grab his Polaroid camera that he frequently uses at his job sites and snaps five photos. He then tells this fantastic story of how the UFO came over him, shot down a blue beam of light all over his body that paralyzed him temporarily and started speaking to him telepathically. Calm down. Stop it. Ed began to levitate off the street. He attempted to scream, but there was no sound. The voice in his head changed from male to female, and then he began to see the images of dogs. Suddenly, the blue beam stopped and dropped him onto the ground. A strange experience to be be sure and one that he recounts is experiencing all alone no witnesses but he did have the five photos he considered sending the pictures to the gulf breeze sentinel a local newspaper in the city without using his name but after discussing it with his wife he decided against it november 17th 1987 ed decides to go ahead and send his pictures into the sentinel but remain anonymous by using the alias Mr. X. Since Ed was the one turning in the pictures, if asked, he would just say that he was Mr. X's friend. November 19th, 1987, the Sentinel runs the story. These Polaroid photos were taken from the front yard of a Gulf Breeze resident Wednesday evening, November 11th. If anybody saw it or knows any information regarding this, please contact the Sentinel. November 20th, 1987, Ed begins to hear a hum in his ear. He starts hearing that UFO voice again, but this time, it's in an African dialect. While this is happening, Ed goes outside and sees the UFO. He shouts at it to leave him alone. A voice responds saying, be calm, step forward. Another voice in Spanish says, los fotos son prohibido. He snaps his photos. He describes hearing a conversation on board the ship from a female saying, you can't expose them. They won't hurt you. It's just some tests. That's all. Ed, our valiant hero, was defiant, shouting, what gives you the right to suck people up into your ship? Suddenly, Ed begins to see naked women. As Ed recalls, these were not drawings of naked women, but actual naked women. Big women, little women, fat, black, white women from every race and every age. There were even pregnant women. The voice tells Ed, we will come for you. November 25th, 1987, Five witnesses come forward saying they saw something in the sky. These five people have no connection with each other and report seeing the same object at different times. One of these witnesses claims to have seen the UFO one hour after Ed's alleged levitating experience. Here's an account of another witness that claimed to have seen the UFO on November 11th. Charlie Summerby and his wife Doris saw this object last November. Charlie, if you could tell us what you saw. Well, it was right after the sunset over East Bay, we saw this circular object. It was bluish gray in color and uh, with light shining out through portholes. And the really amazing thing was, there was no sound. It was November 11th at 8, 10 in the morning. A UFO came within 400 feet of me at treetop level. I noticed two military jets were following it about two air miles. The UFO shot up at a 45 degree angle and waited for the jets to approach a little closer. And then in an instant, it just shot straight up. December 2nd, 1987. Here's where the story gets a little bit weirder. Ed writes about hearing a conversation in his head in Spanish about a baby. A female and a male converse about why they were only given bananas and that they need to keep their voice down or else they'll hear you. Ed says he walks outside and sees a UFO in the distance before it moves right in front of him at illogical speeds. The UFO tells Ed to walk forward. Ed, being defiant, says no, has his Polaroid in one hand and his gun in the other. As Ed lifted his hands, the UFO began to back off and disappear, but not before Ed was able to grab this photo. 
Ed's wife now walks out and is able to see the UFO take off vertically. Later that same night, at about 3.30 in the morning, Ed reaches for the draw cord of one of his blinds and lifts it up. On the other side of the glass, Ed sees a small four foot tall little creature. Ed runs out the door to beat the crap out of this thing when he's struck with that blue beam again. The blue beam eventually lets him go. The UFO trails off, shoots another little blue beam down before disappearing altogether. Ed believed the second blue beam was actually picking up the other little creature. Ed gave an account of what this little dude looked like. It's kind of a boxy looking guy with this silver rod of some kind. December 3rd, 1987. The Sentinel gets a picture from an unnamed person dating back to June of 1986, a full year before Ed's initial experience. This person claims they never released the photos because they didn't want to be seen as a crackpot until Ed came forward with his photos. Also, several other witnesses begin to come forward. December 4th, 1987, MUFON begins an official investigation. December 5th, 1987, a different craft appears behind the tree line and begins to talk to Ed. Do not resist, stay where you are. You are in grave danger. We will not harm you, Zehas. We have come for you. Ed refuses firmly. He snaps a pick and the UFO bails. December 10th, more witnesses come forward to the Sentinel. December 17th, Ed wakes up in the middle of the night with three dark figures standing in his room. As he gets up to attack them or defend himself, a sharp pain begins to happen in his head. His wife is also there that corroborates this. The creatures bail. Ed looks out the window, sees the UFO. He charges out, grabs his camera, grabs his gun. As he runs out, he snaps another photo. The UFO begins to slowly move away. And from Ed's point of view, seems as though the UFO is having some sort of mechanical issue. He snaps a few more photos. December 23rd, two days before Christmas, Ed goes outside to turn his pool filter on and he sees three UFOs lingering above him. The Sentinel also received a few more photos from an anonymous source known as Believer Bill, who took pictures of the same craft. Believer Bill had his photos shown right next to Ed's in the next issue of the Sentinel. December 28th, Ed shoots a video of this UFO flying behind the tree line near his house. January 12th, 1988, the photo that's probably most famous that's associated with this case. Ed is working on a construction site, double checking the AC for the following workday. When a UFO comes down to street level, a white light struck Ed while he was in his truck, paralyzing him, making him immobile. He reports an intense pins and needle feeling in his arms. Ed attempts to sort of reach his shotgun in the back seat, but since he had no feeling in his arm, he couldn't grab it. He sort of guided his hand to the Polaroid camera next to him and with great difficulty was able to snap the infamous photo. Ed was able to get out of the truck with his camera slung around his body and trailing and dragging his shotgun behind him. The UFO speaks to Ed, demanding him to come forward. The UFO then shoots down five blue beams, each time depositing a little creature onto the road, each one with a glowing silver rod that he had seen before. Ed gets back into his truck with very little feeling in his arms and is able to skedaddle. Over the course of three more months, Ed would have several more sightings. On one occasion, January 21st, two men from MUFON agreed to actually stay outside of Ed Walter's home. These two men would work in two 12-hour shifts and they would take turns staking out Ed Walter's house for any activity. They did this for nine days. They gave Ed a walkie-talkie in case he began to hear anything or see anything to radio over to one of them in the car. January 21st, Ed begins to hear a hum in his head, radios over to the guy in the car. Unfortunately, he didn't see anything. Bob Reed was his name, the MUFON rep that was outside, reports only seeing an airplane. January 24th, Ed takes a man named Dwayne Cook, the publisher of the Gulf Breeze Sentinel, to go out with him to try and track down one of these UFOs. While driving down Highway 98, Ed reports an intense pain began happening in his head, so much so that he thought his eyeball was gonna pop out of its socket. Ed pulls over to Soundside Drive, which is where the infamous road UFO shot was taken in an attempt to lure the UFO out. He wrote that Dwayne Cook actually filmed this experience on camera, but Ed ended up getting out of the car, screaming at the top of his lungs in the middle of the road, why won't you just leave me alone? Show yourself. As Ed was screaming this with such intensity, he looked over behind Dwayne, snapped a photo, as Dwayne turned away, it immediately winked out. While Dwayne didn't get to see the UFO himself, he did witness Ed Walters snap the photo. Dwayne said, I know one thing, I saw you shoot this picture, and this is the picture I saw you pull out of the camera, and I peeled it. There is no online record of this video between Dwayne and Ed, 
that I was able to find. Several more encounters with the UFO were reported by Ed. The UFOs also continue to refer to him as Zehas and telling him, we're here for you and in sleep you'll know. Around this time, Ed begins to look into regressive hypnosis that might reveal anything else to him. Perhaps something in his subconscious memories. February 7th, the UFO chases Frances, Ed's wife, and shoots a blue beam down at her, which she's barely able to escape. Ed was able to snap this photo. February 10th, Ed is given a brand new camera by MUFON, a Nimslow 3D camera. This camera would be internally locked so that if anybody tried to go inside to touch or mess with the film, it would be noticed. The MUFON investigators use this camera for the specific purpose of making it impossible for Ed Walters to fake. As Ed states, I faced a dilemma. I had been hoping the UFO would get out of my life. Now I had to pray that it would return for at least one more photograph. During this time, Dr. Bruce McAbee, a physicist, would begin his photo analysis in the case. Ed is also encouraged to take a polygraph test in regards to the pictures. Ed complies and completes two polygraph tests over the course of four days. The conclusion, with the information that is available to this examiner at this time, it is felt that Mr. Walters truly believes that the photographs and personal sightings he has described are true and factual to the best of his ability. February 26th, Ed uses the MUFON camera to take pictures of lights in the sky. The photos were revealed during a press conference in public. They were hard to see and didn't reveal much, but it was implied it was a large object way in the distance, possibly a mothership. After this, Ed went out and bought a new Polaroid with the intention of having a camera that's more difficult to double expose, the easier it is to prove that the photos were legitimate. Shortly after buying the camera, he experiences the UFO again and snaps this photo. March 20th, the familiar hum and Zehas and sleep you'll know begins to ring through Ed's ears. Ed went outside with yet another camera rig. This camera rig had two cameras on one device. They would take a photo at the same time. This would also help triangulate the distance of the object and the size of it. Critics and debunkers are heavily invested at this point. Ed describes these people as only using half-truths with the intention of discrediting him as a person because they aren't able to disprove his photographs. And while all this is happening, Ed has been working on his regressive hypnosis, and those three events of missing time slowly become more clear to him. These three events were as follows. At age 17, Ed sees an alien face above him while he's sleeping. He yells for his brother, Bert. Bert, who is then awakened, tries to rationalize with Ed that it was probably just his cat. However, there were wet footprints that lead from outside and into Ed and Bert's room. There were several small tracks showing several coming and goings, most of them going to Ed's room. Bert had noticed that Ed was wet, but he hadn't been outside. The second event, Ed is now aged 25. He's driving down the road and sees a light shoot past him. The light begins to circle him and Ed pulls off to the side of the road. To his perspective, this happened very quickly, but several hours of time are now missing. The third event, Ed is now age 33. He's out canoeing one day when he hits a large metallic object that slowly begins to glow green. Bubbles begin to come out from the water. The current or some other force begins to draw him closer to the center of this glowing phenomenon. Suddenly, he finds himself lying down in his canoe. He's much closer to shore, but several miles away. Hours had passed. Finally, Ed believes the first night of this experience back in November 11th, he was abducted and his memory was wiped. May 1st, Ed goes down to the Soundside Beach to confront the UFO. At some point while he's there, he begins to hear it and snaps these two photos with his SRS camera rig. He reports his hand smelling bad with some sort of black residue or particles underneath his fingernails. He saves these particles for later. His face is bruised and about an hour and 15 minutes had passed with him having no recollection of what had happened. That was the final sighting in Ed's book. Now, very interesting story, no doubt about it. And Gulf Breeze has, has been known uh, for UFO activity. And there was another sighting in, let me pull it up here. It was um, in 2019. Just a moment. Yeah, Gulf Breeze, um, 2019. An unidentified flying object was seen over the Midway area in Santa Rosa County. Uh, according to George Sheldon III, a witness who captured the whole incident on a cell phone video, stated he saw a bright light flashing like a beacon in the sky on Monday night around 11.30 p.m. Sheldon said the craft appeared over the southern sky in near Midway in Gulf Breeze. 
the witnesses told the the witness told us the object was in front of the clouds and caused them to illuminate. Sheldon said he quickly grabbed his camera to capture the sighting and repeated, he's never seen a light like this before. Channel 3 News asked Sheldon what he thought the object was, and he stated that it, it's for the first time he's never seen anything odd or out of the ordinary due to him being an avid sky watcher, but doubts that this is a military craft. So we got a lot of sightings, and, and we just watched the video about um, a sighting that was uh, very famous. But, folks, there's kind of another side to that story. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share this the with model. you. Right. Right. Now, Gulf, oh, oh, by the way, Gulf Breeze is such a UFO mecca that they have something called the Shoreline Park there. It's like a UFO park, okay, uh, you know, for people to visit, that sort of thing. I guess it's probably something similar to the Roswell Museum, only probably not as good as that. But let me go ahead and pull this up. Okay, Tim, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen, sir. And okay. a little while back, I think it may have been about 10 or so years ago, um, someone was actually cleaning out the attic of this guy's house. Okay. That, you know, they, he'd sold it or whatever over the years. And they came upon something interesting. And what they came upon was this. This was a model that was actually found in the attic of that man's house years after he'd, he'd left. Now look at the similarities between the photo that he was, all the photos he was taking and this model, I guess, make up your own mind. You know, do you think that this is the same thing? Are we looking at the same thing? It looks pretty similar. Um, was this guy a hoaxer, or was this planted there to um, to debunk the man's story? I mean, that's also a possibility, I think. But it's interesting that 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 was found in that man's house. So, what do you guys think? What do you guys think in the chat room? Oh, and I also wanted to say, guys, for whatever reason, I'm having a problem uh, typing this evening. There's something going on with my system. I don't want to reboot right now. So unfortunately, I'm not going to be able to chat with you folks. But thanks for coming, everybody. Okay. What I'm going to say is this. Um, Bruce McAfee, the ufologist that was investigating Ed Walters, said that Ed Walters lived a lifestyle where he trusted his neighbors and he always had his garage door open and always left his front door open. And the idea of him making a model to fake this type of sighting that terrorized him and his wife for years uh, was ridiculous. And they said it was some type of uh, plant to discredit him. Um, the thing is, is other people in the community also were filming these objects. And in that video I just showed, um, it showed a, um, a picture of the same object, but kind of reddish colored from like a year prior to him coming out with his photos. So that co corroborates what he saw and what he photographed. My thoughts on this are frankly that, I mean, a lot of other people witnessed this, this particular object. This person was not the only person doing it. We do know that it was filmed from different vantage points. Um, you know, is this guy a hoaxer? I, I don't know. I, I, I really don't know how to answer that at this point. I do think it looks odd that that model was found in, in his vacant home. Uh, I do think it looks very similar to the photos that he was taking. But that being said, an awful lot of people uh, that are in the know and the ufology know, if you will, had eyeballs on this thing from MUFON and on, on up. So I don't know. Matthew, what are your thoughts on this one? Uh, I don't know. It's it's difficult to tell. Uh, I, I think that, you know, lis listening to his story, I think there are definitely parallels with my with my experience. So to me, it's clear he knew something about this. Um, now, I, I think the question is, was he, you know, maybe doctoring photos because he wanted some kind of physical evidence that he could show people? Um, because they really don't leave much physical evidence. And so it's, it, it, it's hard to believe someone just based on their say so, you know, but I think, right. uh, I think that that could have been a possibility too, that maybe he was, this was actually happening to him, but he, he knew he needed physical proof. So he produced it. Um, actually, um, deeper research by, McAfee claims that they 
you know, MUFON gave him that special locked camera. Mm-hmm. And he was able to photograph the same object that he had been photographing with the Polaroid camera to justify the fact that, no, he's not tampering with the film. He's not doctoring them. They are legitimate. Mm-hmm. So in this case, I would say what he's seeing is real. Well, I mean, in, unfortunately, the, the hoaxers are out there. You know, you can look at the Billy Myers story. For those of you that are familiar with that, he's, I believe, Swedish or something like that. And back during the 70s, <coughs> excuse me, back during the 70s, he came up with some some unbelievable photographs. And they're all over the Internet. You can go look them up. Billy Meyer, M-E-I-J-E-R, I think. Anyway, um, some of those, you look at those photos, <coughs> and depending on how you feel about Billy Meyer, those photos are too good to be true, in my opinion. I think they look... There's just something off about the photos then that that guy's taken. But then again, there are people out there and, and even people in ufology that will swear that this guy's legit uh, and then those photos are legit. So I guess. It, it, uh, although I'm going to jump in here real quick, Tommy, uh, my brother went to Germany and he actually met Billy Meyer one on one. And he, he stayed in, he camped out in the field where those uh, UFOs were filmed. Okay, and he said Billy Meyer has absolutely no college education, none whatsoever, yet he has advanced knowledge of quantum physics, advanced knowledge of astronomy. And he was taught this from the visitors that came from those ships. So um, my brother is a, a, a believer. Now, whether that justifies the fact that his footage and his photographs are real. I can't say that because like we've said before here on the channel, that if we're not there and we don't see it, then to us, we don't have the providence to prove it. So that's Mm -hmm. where I stand. Difficult to hoax, but not impossible. Right. Now I have a picture, the exact picture that Ed Walters took, the most famous one of his vehicle. And here it is. That's it right there above the road. This is actual. Now, this looks a lot like the model, except the model had a wider base. Um, it doesn't appear to be exactly like the model. I, I do think that there are some differences. Um, right. It's not exactly like the model. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And this is Ed Walters, by the way. Back in the day. Back in 87. Mm-hmm. He's much older now, but. Well, um, folks, I guess I guess for the moment that, uh, that everybody loves on, on the show every week, we're going to go ahead and roll the uh, UFO video uh, review of the week. And uh, let's see. We've got some really interesting stuff this week. Uh, please feel free to comment on this, folks. Okay, here we go. Now, this one doesn't have any sound, but um, I went in and I stabilized this footage because it's so jerky. I wanted uh, people to actually see the lights along the edge. Um, It's very interesting. Take a look at this. It flashes. Yes, it does. Huh. Looks like it's also picking up the sunlight reflecting off of it at times as well. Now, I slowed it down at the end, and I got a clear shot of the lights along the edge. And you'll be amazed by that when I get to it. Um, It actually has red, green, and white lights. This is seen over Maricopa, Arizona. Now, here we go. I gave you a different looks at it. 
So you can see it flash. It has some, kind of some weird movements to it. Mm -hmm. It's waggling, like it, kind of. Like it's rocking back and forth, right. side to side. Hmm. And when was this uh, seen? When was this um, sighting, Tim? Uh, I think it was in 2018. Hmm. Interesting. But here, check that out. See? White. White, yep. red, green. Yep. And this was one of the frames from the actual shot. I slowed it down, zoomed in, and this is what I got. That That's is standard. what I, Yes. Wow. Now, whether that's one of ours, I have no clue. Here are UFOs responding to lasers over the East Seti Ranch and at other C5 oh, come events. <laughs> come on. Powered up. <laughs> It is getting brighter. It's it's kind of. Oh, there it goes. There it goes. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. Yeah, there it goes. There it is. There's the power up. Whoa. Yeah. Got it. <laughs> I got it. Yeah. <laughs> we have a disclaimer. You shouldn't be doing this because mm -hmm. if you accidentally laser point a jet or a plane, you could cause massive injury or even a crash. Or, and plus, it's illegal. So yeah. Plus, I mean, you don't know what you're. I mean, you you don't know how the, this thing's going to react. To that and obviously, it is reacting. We've seen this before with other uh, yahoos out there pointing industrial lasers at, at lights in the sky. Uh, I I personally think it's a bad idea. I, I just I wouldn't do it. Uh, and if you do it, uh, you may have to take the the consequences. But here we go. Mm -hmm. They like the whole shit. Like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's picking up speed now. Oh, he is. He's powering up. Whoa, look at that. Look at that. This is all in night vision. Whoa, that was that was an incredible one. That was a night I got it all on film. Amazing. Don D says they're fake. They're not fake. Sounds like a hell of a party. Oh, look at that power up. Yeah. Whoa, that's yeah. massive, man. You like that? Nice. Yeah. Whoa. Some of these are just powering up. Mm -hmm.
Interesting. That's just a bad idea. <clears throat> I think a lot of people think they're communicating with them, but they could cause some issues. Sure. Okay, I'm going to stop this for a second. This video was filmed from a mobile scope truck using a FLIR system to track an A-10 Warthog running training missions in Arizona. During the training session, a UAP was observed to be following the A-10. The mobile scope truck operator began to film the UAP. Rumors of this footage began to float around and our source investigated the claims and was able to track down this footage. Our source states that Border Patrol only operates three or more un unmanned aerial vehicles east of Sierra Vista. This object was not one of those UAVs. Our source also states this footage was possibly investigated by the Air Force as they were contacted and that this incident was reported. Air Force personnel came out and obtained this footage from the truck itself using a laptop. This object was emitting heat, so that's why it's white. I get closer. That's the A-10 Warthog right there. That's not the UFO.
It gets bigger here shortly so we can take a better look at it. Yeah, that's what it looked like right there. Now, it kept phase shifting as, as it was moving. It kept changing shape. I don't know if you noticed that, Matthew. Did you? Yeah, I did notice that. And I, I've noticed that in other videos as well. Like the, I, I, don't, I don't know if you've seen the Puerto Rico video. Yes, um, it did the same. Yeah, it, it, had, it had that same characteristic about it. Right. So this is very interesting because this was supposedly leaked from Homeland Security recently. So it, it's uh, not widely circulated, but we do have it. Okay, here we go. Cruise ship captain witnesses and films UFO. Now I don't have much footage. Yeah, I had footage. the drone on board, so I thought it would be a nice night to catch a sunset. I had the drone in my hand and someone said, what's that? And we look up. And there was, it, I put it on TikTok, it looked like a black jellyfish, a gigantic black jellyfish. And it sailed right over the retreat, directly through the center line of the ship, right through our X and our stack, and just floated through. The thing was, we had no wind, maybe five knots at the time. But this thing was cruising along about 10, 15 miles per hour, just cruised right over. And as it passed the, the stern of the ship, it went a couple hundred meters, maybe three to 400 meters, and then it started to descend into the water. But because of the sunset, we couldn't put a rescue boat down to go see what it was. But it disappeared into the water. And we have no idea. It wasn't a drone. There was no noise associated with it. So if you want to see our UFO, it's on TikTok. <laughs> <laughs> so that's what she saw right there. She said it looked like a black jellyfish when it flew over the cruise ship. But this doesn't look like that to me. But anyways, that's what the cruise captain saw. Seven lights hover in place over San Diego, California. The one on the right is going out. Huh. Yeah. It might be. Hmm. Kind of far away. Can't really tell. Yeah, those are only three, but watch. I thought at first they might be players, but they're not fall they're not falling. You know, they're not falling, so I, I don't know. Now, there's not just three. There's going to be seven. There's four. four. In a line? Are you serious? Yeah. So we've never seen a line. Totally bizarre. Um, yeah. Are you live? It's almost diamond shaped. No. <clears throat> it's almost diamond shaped. It's as if there's something on top, something on the bottom, and then a middle space. A red, a fifth one. Oh, there's five. Wow. Red flashing light. This isn't good. <laughs> yeah, there's no way those are flares. That's not happening. Um, Drones, maybe, but they're awfully bright. Actually, I think it's just weird right now. 
our children to get on to music, I think we need to tune in. This isn't a great fight to see over the Pacific Ocean, over uh, North Island, based in Cornwall. Six. Six. Okay, this is definitely not good. What are we doing, honey? This is not good. I'm going to get off because I'm too scared. Bye. Wait, this is not good. We're getting attacked, honey. No, we're not. What is this? Penny, what go, is this? Go turn on the news. <clears throat> Seven. Perfectly horizontal, yeah. almost. Yes, almost they perfect. They might actually be. It's just the angle we're looking at them. Right. <clears throat> Now, when I made my photograph, I photographed 10, and there's seven. I think they're flares. I think they're illumination flares. I think they're. They're not the night. Not like anybody. I think when they go out, I think they're they're just. They're not flares. Flares don't hang in the air like that. I mean, they're no, not, they're not, not they're not descending. Long. They're not descending to the ground. You you. I mean, they're holding position. Yeah, they don't hold their position that long, Flair. The elevation being the same is, is an extraordinarily precise. Should I? What are you going to do? Post, post. I wouldn't alert. Like. <clears throat> no, I won't alert. Yeah. So I'm, uh, I'm not going for flares. Drones, maybe, but those are awfully bright lights. I would just put I it on. Considering how Obviously, far away they are, yeah. Mount Helix yeah. can see it. Anything facing west can see it. That's the seven. Yeah, yeah, that's 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 different. Here's an egg-shaped UFO over Saint Michel, France. Passion est arrivée. Paris est habité. On a un bel objet volant. Tic tac. Le temps même est sûrement identifié comme un ami. Could be. Qui visite. What do you think, Matthew? Yeah, I, I, the shape of it's certainly very odd. I mean, it, it definitely fits with the description of the Tic Tac, for sure. Right. Kind of looks like we're looking at it from uh, the end. Bon, les petits amis, la confirmation est arrivée. Paris est habité. Hey, Bob Gray, je parle français, un peu. Means I do speak French a little. Puppy. All un. Pascal. Bon route à toi, mon ami. Car en chacun de nous encore, tu vis. N'est-ce pas? What's he saying? He's saying, I don't know what it is, Nespa, do you? Hmm. That's it right there. Flashing UFO over Commerce, California. UFO. UFO right here. Yeah. There it is. Flashing lights. Look at that. Holy shit. 
UFO. You got next time you should have come to the casino with me. Oh, oh god damn. Holy shit. Where'd it go? Look at this UFO. UFO right here. Zoom in on it. There it is. Flashing lights. Look at that. Holy shit. UFO. You got next time you should have come to the casino with me. Oh, oh god damn. Holy shit. Where'd it go? <laughs> Look at this UFO. I kind of think this right might there. be a drone, but yeah, I'm not sure. There it is. Yeah, that's kind of what I think, too. I mean, it, it, it. plus it's over a busy freeway like that. You know, you're you're bound to make it on the news, something like that. <laughs> mm -hmm. Right. And the way it's flashing uh, almost seems pre-programmed. Can't zoom in on it. There it is. Flashing lights. Look at that. And the guy freaked out though, and that's uh, oh, precious God. in itself. Holy shit! Where'd it go? Look at this UFO. One last UFO time. Right here. You see it? Can't zoom in on it. There it is. Flashing lights. Look at that. Holy shit! UFO. You got next time. You should have come to the casino with me. Although there is oh, that God one damn. little white light that's Holy off to shit. the bottom of it. Go. I don't know what it is. See it Look right there. UFO. UFO right here. See it? Could be it. Could be a star. Yeah, it could lights. be. Look at that. Holy it shit. just seems to be moving UFO. with the light. Yeah, if you look. Should have come to the casino with me. Oh, oh god damn. Holy shit. Where'd it go? I want that ringtone now. Yeah, that'd be a good ringtone, wouldn't it? So. <laughs> All right, that's the end of our main UFO man um, UFO video review for this week. But I do have one more video I would like to play real quick. It's only a minute, 20 seconds. Uh, I got to see if I can bring it up here and then we'll play it. And then we'll go into our segment with Matthew. Well, how's that getting here? Okay, here we go. This is allegedly a UFO on the ground at Area 51 that raises up, travels to the right, goes to the left, and blinks out. Down there is Area 51, and... If you can see those lights down there, it's been going on for the last couple of days. You can see lights like going up and down and moving all around. Like like right now, you see that one right there? Look, it's going up. It's starting to go up. It's been there for like the last 20 minutes or so. Now it's going up. And this has been going on for the last couple of days. And look, you can see it's going up and up. And I don't know what it is, but this is... Very unusual colored light. It, right. Now I know that um, what's going, what goes on down here at, at um, Area 51, and we've been like camped out here for a while. And look, 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 it's moving, it's moving, it's going, it's, go, it's going in the other direction. Now you see, you see, this, this is the kind of stuff that. Uh, oh, did you see that? It's gone. Okay, one thing I want to say about this video, I was asked the question when I posted it, how did they film that? so close to area 51 what with the restrictive uh grounds uh where you can't get very close anymore but they were using a uh, they were using a nikon d1000 with a 400 millimeter zeiss lens so uh the thing about a d1000 camera with a 400 millimeter zoom lens, you can see the rings of Saturn. So if you're far away from uh, Area 51, you can bring it in real close. So that's how they did that. And uh, I just wanted to give that corroborating evidence. But that's an interesting video. I don't, I don't know what it is. Somebody said it's uh, a certain type of gas that burns blue, and um, I have seen other UFOs that are blue of that color. So um, I don't know what to say about that. What do you think, Matthew? 
I I don't know. I mean, I I think that that was you know my immediate thought was I don't know how they got that close to Area Fifty One, but um, right. I guess because I was under the impression that it, it's that that area is so wide now that you can't even see the base at all from the ground, like no matter what. I, that's so that was my impression. So I don't, but I don't know. I well, according to what I understand, these guys kind of somehow got this footage uh, from a high mountain peak. And I know there is a mountain peak that you can see Area 51 from. Um, I don't remember which which one it is, but it's the only re remaining one that you can go to. But it's so far away that you can't see it with the naked eye. You almost have to see it with a zoom lens. So that's why I checked into whether what camera equipment they were using because otherwise I couldn't justify the footage. So anyways, okay, moving on. We are going into our next segment this evening, our featured segment, uh, the interview of Matthew Roberts. Uh, Matthew, would you like to tell us a little bit about yourself? Uh, yeah, so, um, you know, you, you gave me that introduction there. I was on the, the Theodore Roosevelt uh, in 2015 um, for the Gimbal event. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I spent a total of 16 years in the Navy. I was a cryptologist, which is kind of a, a field of study within Intel. Um, and I did that for 16 years in the Navy. Um, and I, uh, I, I, after my tour on the Theodore Roosevelt, I transferred to the Office of Naval Intelligence, um, where I, you know, ended my naval career. Um, you know, after seeing the gimbal footage uh, on board the Theodore Roosevelt uh, first in 2015, and I thought I'd never see it again. Uh, yeah, that's that's a, a still shot of the gimbal. Um, you know, I, I never thought I would see that again. And then when I transferred to O and I, as soon as I got there, um, that was when this, you know, this New York times article hit. Um, and it was after that while working at O and I that I had, you know, these kind of follow on experiences with the phenomenon. Okay. Didn't you also see the go fast? <clears throat> yeah. This yeah, one? So yeah, the, so the GoFast was also a part of that. Um, th those those two videos are both uh, from the Theodore Roosevelt encounter. Can um, you? Sorry, go ahead, Tommy. If if I may, um, when these uh, when these incidents happened, was this like a common knowledge thing that everybody in the on the ship knew about? I mean, the, did the rumor mill fly, or how did that all work out? Uh, no, no, it was. It, I mean, it wasn't something that the entire ship knew about it was uh it, it was pretty much limited to um us, us in intel and then obviously the air wing um kind of knew about it and i i don't, I don't know how much they were talking about it i i wasn't i i, I didn't see any kind of sh like ship-wide uh rumor mill happening um people on board weren't going crazy about it <laughs> So, uh, so I assume that they just didn't know, um, to be honest. I, I think most people had no idea that this was happening. Uh, well, what I want to ask is, was it a common occurrence from time to time to see odd things flying around in the sky around your ships? Uh, no. So, you know, I, uh, like I said, I was in for 16 years, and this is the first time I had ever seen anything like this. Um, it, so this was not something that I was used to or in any way prepared to deal with. Um, right. Yeah. No, it, it, so for me, it was not a common occurrence. However, uh, you know, the, the pilots, uh, the two of the pilots from the ship were on that show unidentified. And one of right. them was talking about how, you know, for at one point, uh, for him, you know, taking off from the East Coast there in Virginia, uh, this is kind of like a normal, everyday occurrence that he would right. see these things. Right. Um, but, for, but for me, you know, 
in the Navy on the water, this is the first time I had ever seen anything like that. Okay. Um, can you confirm this? The question I want to ask you without violating your NDA is, can you confirm that the GoFast and the Gimbal are not part of the American arsenal or any other foreign adversarial arsenal that you're aware of? Um, yeah, uh, I mean, so, and, and you know, the, 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 the report that was released to the public pretty much says that as well. Uh, a lot of people look at this report. Oh, it's only nine pages. It really doesn't say a lot. Um, but that's just not the case. I mean, so, so it, it describes that there were, you know, 146 some instances of unidentified. Right. And right. And, and of those 146, one of them was identified. And, and they give you all of these buckets in which these things can be identified as either our own equipment, as adversary um, technology, as natural weather phenomenon. And then they have this other bucket, this catch-all bucket. And so what they're saying is that um, 145 of these instances fall into that other bucket. They, they don't fall into any of those categories. They are still not identified because they are none of those things. Um, right. Meaning they could be extraterrestrial and they could also be interdimensional, extra dimensional yeah. or something we just don't know. Right. 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 Yeah. And, you know, I, 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 I would point people to, you know, Chris Mellon, um, published in the days after the report uh, an article um, that he wrote, which which basically says that, you know, when is the, the mainstream media and science going to take this alien hypothesis seriously? Because this right. is the most, he, he kind of outlines a case for how this is and why this is the most likely scenario at this point. Um, and so, th th you know, this guy was like the number three guy at the Pentagon at one point. Um, so right. when he says something like that, you can't just, <laughs> you can't just blow that off. I mean. Right. Right. No, Plus, um, no, no reason to come out and <laughs> fabricate any of this information. Oh, yeah. I mean, uh, he's not gaining anything uh, in doing this. Uh, if anything, it's, it's something that would tarnish his career. Um, but he, the thing is, this is this is a part of a, a larger push to try and normalize this subject. Um, right. He also so, has uh, CIA connections, Chris Mellon. Yeah. Well, yeah. I well, I, I, I mean, I'm sure he's got all kinds of connections. I mean, it, it just being that high up in government. Um, well, I mean, one of his relatives is uh, the head of the CIA, or was. Yeah. Yeah, he comes from a very famous family, mm -hmm. so yeah, a lot mm -hmm. of money. Yep, a lot of money. And again, the, because he has so much money, he doesn't have he doesn't need to make money off of ufology. No, no reason no. for that. No, and 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 it wouldn't be worth his time to be honest with you. In in right. terms of probably what his net worth is, um, mm -hmm. you know, he'd be. This is the equivalent of like scraping pennies out of the couch to him. Uh, I'm sure. sure if he's, right. if he's even getting paid at all for any of these appearances, he does. I'm sure he doesn't even care. Uh, right. He, he's also a part of an organization called the Adam project, which mm -hmm. is a partnership with Lou Elizondo and one other figure that broke free from the TTSA or to the stars Academy. And we found out that, actually to the stars academy and the adam project formed a new partnership uh together to study metamaterials recently and are about to release a uh creda report uh in september of 2021 um i know the report's going to congress and it allegedly it's supposed to be released in public format as well but it started coming out in 2020 in September, and we didn't get September 2020's report to the public. So I don't know if it's going to happen this year, but we're keeping our ear to the ground on that one. 
Yeah. Yeah, one can only hope, right? I mean. Right. Um, can you tell us a little bit about your book? Yeah, so uh, it's called uh, Initiated. It's right here. Uh, it's available on uh, Amazon. I had to self-publish uh, because nobody wanted to pu publish my book. I'm a nobody, you know. Um, yeah, and I, I wrote it uh, kind of to explain uh, my life and uh, the, the, the events that happened to me um, while I was working at O and I, uh, and I mean, if you're looking for any kind of classified junk, there's not going to be anything in there. This is all my own personal experiences with the phenomenon. Um, you know, when I wrote the book, I had to, uh, get it approved, uh, for release because of the fact that I had a clearance. Uh, but that's right. just, that's standard procedure. If I wrote a children's book, I would have to get that cleared too. It's just, it's just what they do. Um, so yeah, that's why there's the, uh, you know, the disclaimer at the bottom. I had to put that on there. <laughs> I, I, I gotta say, I spoke to Terry Lovelace and he said you originally wrote a book that was denied by the, U.S. Navy or by the Department of Defense because it was too spot on? Um, you know, nobody ever, I, I, I'm not sure how to word this or how to put this. Nobody ever, nobody ever really denied the book, but there were things, there were things in it that I think uh, definitely maybe hit a raw chord. And, uh, and so I, I, I took those things out. I, you know, upon reflecting on it, I thought, you know, if this is, if, if those things are going to cause, um, just this huge, uh, storm, uh, as though, you, you know, I figured it was just, it was just best to leave it out if, if that was what it was going to be. So this is the same book. It's just been revised. Yeah, there, there, there were some, some little tweaks here and there. Okay. <laughs> well, can you uh, share some of your personal experiences with you? Have you ever had experiences with uh, UFOs and that sort of thing? Uh, yeah. Well, I mean, aside from um, being uh, present for the gimbal event and seeing the footage uh, for the first time in a skiff. Um, there have been a couple of things that I've seen, you know, up in the sky. Um, like when I was going through all of this, uh, there was one point that, you know, I, I drove down to uh, Norfolk uh, or Portsmouth, actually. Um, and I, because I have some rental properties down there. Um, and so I was tending to them for the weekend. And as I was, you know, getting my bags out of my truck, I kind of looked up at the horizon and I saw this like football shaped, um, copperish kind of like, uh, football looking thing, just floating on the horizon, you know? And unfortunately I had already put my cell phone inside. So, and it was moving fast enough that I knew if I ran in to grab it, it would be gone anyway. And so I just didn't, didn't even bother, but I, I, I did see that. And then years before my experiences, there was this, um, I was at that same house actually in Portsmouth and I was out in the backyard, uh, with my dogs and, uh, I looked up at the sky and I saw this, uh, this thing just floating across the sky and the shape of it was just, it was nonsense. It looked like, a if I had to describe it, I would say it looked like this uh, chunk of coal um, or a rock just um, drifting across the sky. And, uh, you know, at the time I saw it, I thought, you know, that's got to be some kind of a giant garbage bag or something. But it, you know, when you see a bag and it's kind of drifting in the wind, you'll see it like shift and and Ripple. kind of change shape as the wind is hitting it, you know, and there, there was none of that. It it maintained its shape and its trajectory the entire time, but it was just, 
the shape was nonsense. I mean, it didn't, it was not aerodynamic. It was not, I mean, how often do you see a rock floating through the sky, you know? Not very um, often. <laughs> but, you know, that that's, that's what it was. And I just kind of blew it off. It's got to be something. It has to have some kind of prosaic explanation, you know? And so I just right. brushed it off. But, you know, after I started experiencing these, kind of personal follow on experiences those were that was something that i looked back on and i was like hmm i wonder wonder if that was something you know and i just didn't understand that at the time um but yeah i uh you know the book is all about um this kind of journey that i went on with with all of this and it was um it, it was difficult. It was really, really difficult. Uh, you know, there were, this whole experience was just something that was just so um, deeply personal with them. Uh, and, and, and I, you know, experiencers talk about this a lot, about how there's just all this heavy emotion uh, that's involved with these experiences. It's not, it, it doesn't just, it doesn't just stay in the realm of my experience with some other being, you know, it's, 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 you've got to deal with all of this baggage you've got all of a sudden, you know, could be the, the death of a family member or some kind of heavy baggage, um, that they just kind of force you to deal with. Um, so ultimately, um, the way I describe this is a uh, like a journey um, through personal transformation, and I called it uh, initiated because I realized that these um, these experiences were like a conditioning of my mind. They were uh, they were conditioning me to think a certain way. Um, and they were doing this on purpose because um, if you do this correctly um, and you deal with these things and you start thinking correctly, uh, what happens is you kind of arrive at this, I, I guess today you would call it a spiritual awakening, um, but I just kind of, I, I, I kind of, I, I don't know that I like that word because I, I, I feel like spiritual awakening tends to kind of put it in the realm of something that's, you know, um, uh, uh, woo woo or something like that. Oh, but this is non tangible. Yeah. Yeah. But this is, but the, the reality of this is that it's just, um, it, it's a natural part of the universe in which we live. And, um, and they're just trying to get us to realize that just like they do. Um, if right. that makes any sense, you know, and if, uh, if you want some experiences like, uh, you know, the, the story you, we were talking about earlier about how the guy woke up and he saw shadow people in his room. Yeah. Uh, you know, that's something that is very familiar <laughs> to me. I, I know that feeling, uh, and, you know, initially that was, it was very terrifying. I'll, um, I'll talk about the first um, being that I saw in my room. Uh, so I was asleep, uh, one night, um, and I, uh, felt somebody grab my arm as I'm sleeping in bed. And so I, I wake up, you know, and I'm not immediately startled. I'm kind of groggy. Uh, so I'm, I'm waking up and, uh, I'm looking at the window off to my left and I can see, you know, the detail on the trim or whatever. And then it starts to, everything starts to go a little bit blurry. Uh, and I, I kind of went, wanted to raise my hands to my eyes to kind of wipe away the, the sleep out of my eyes. Cause I thought that's what was kind of happening. Um, but I realized I couldn't move. Um, I was paralyzed, you know, uh, and so I, I realized, okay, well, wait, I, I initially woke up cause I felt somebody grab my arm and I can still feel that hand on my arm. You know, it was grabbing me like right here, just below the shoulder. 
so I, I fought to turn my head to the right to see who it was. Um, and as I did that, like my room was becoming blurrier and, uh, darker. And so finally I get my head turned to the right and I see this just shadow of a person standing over me. And it's like, uh, I can see a, a torso, two arms and a head, you know, and it's bent over looking into my face. And, um, as I'm looking at this, all of a sudden this, uh, the golden light starts to illuminate my room from the back of this shadow person that's standing over me. And then the light becomes, uh, like blinding. And then it concentrates into these rays of light that are coming out of its head. Um, and then I see a face appear and it's, it's like, it's like there's a tablet in front of this person's face in there and it starts flipping through, you know, images of people that I know. And then it stops on an image of an ex of mine from 20 years ago. <laughs> and so I'm looking at this and I'm just like, what is going on? You know, and I thought to myself at the time, you know, I should be terrified. There's somebody in my room um, standing over me, but I'm, I'm not terrified for some reason. Um, so I drift off back to sleep, you know, and I start having this sexual dream of me and my ex from 20 years ago. And the dream itself, the dream state itself was kind of odd because it was, you know, just me and my ex and there was nothing else. Like every, the, the, everything else, we were just surrounded by black. There was nothing there. Uh, there was no floor. There was no bed, no room we were in. It was nothing. <laughs> so I thought that was odd. But then, you know, I start to wake up and I'm back in my room. And I can see that there is a female on top of me. Uh, she's having sex with me. And, um, my hands are on her thighs and, uh, her skin does not feel like normal human skin. It's, it's much thicker, uh, and, uh, smoother and kind of tighter than, than human skin would be. Um, and it was in that realization and I'm looking at her and, and her skin is blue. And I think to myself, this, I, I, my thought was, I can't believe this is happening. You know, I, this woman on top of me is not human. Um, and I even thought to myself at the time, there's got to be some kind of, you know, craft parked in the backyard um, that she got out of. And it's waiting for her, <laughs> you know. Uh, so, so, you know, I'm in and out of this dream state several times. Uh, and then you know, I eventually wake up in my bed the next morning. Uh, and I was just kind of like, what happened last night? You know, I, I went down to my truck, um, to smoke a cigarette and just kind of take it in. Um, and I was just like, you know, this is a nightmare. I, th this is what occurred to me at the time. Right. I thought this is, this is a nightmare. Uh, this is just too much, uh, that they're doing this, you know, and I don't know, you know, based, I, based on the things that I knew, um, you know, about all of this, I, and I didn't know much, right. I, I, I didn't know a whole lot more <laughs> than the public knows. Um, but I had seen this footage within a skiff, so I knew that that was real. Right. You know, I was there. Uh, I, I knew that this had been taken by our fighter pilots. So this was not, I knew this was not garbage and not nonsense. So, so I, I knew that I wasn't going crazy either. You know, I, I knew that right. this, this was really happening, you know, and, and, but, but a lot of people in that situation may doubt their sanity. I never did. I, I, I knew what it was, you know, I wasn't stupid. Um, so yeah, that was, that was the first entity I saw in my room at night. Uh, and I saw many others after that. 
uh, many different kinds. Um, I, I, that's, that's, um, that's an amazing story. My goodness. Yeah. I mean, physical contact, things like that. I mean, that's, um, that's the stuff that uh, UFO ufologists and researchers like ourselves love to love to hear. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and uh, it, it, but like I said, it, the experience doesn't stop there. There's all these other things that are involved, you know, there's like paranormal activity. There's uh, mm -hmm. like when I was going through this, I would have, I would have horrible nightmares, right? I'd, I'd wake up just covered in sweat um, um, from like the worst nightmare I've ever had. And that happened every night for months, <laughs> you know, and it was, it was awful. It was horrible. I mean, there were, I remember one day I was just so, drenched with sweat. I literally probably could have wrung my shirt out. I got up and I turned the light on and I looked back at my bed and I could see like the sweat outline of my body. <laughs> it was wow. insane. Um, hmm. Yeah. So there, you know, there's all of that. And then there, are, so, so there's dreams involved. There's nightmares. There's, uh, there's all kinds of things there. I wake up some nights to like, uh, pounding on the walls. Uh, I would wake up some nights to like the sound of a woman screaming in the house. Uh, but there was no female living in the house, you know? Wow. So uh, par paranormal events. Yeah. Yeah. It was just, it was like, it was like all of the above, you know? <laughs> Do you, do you think that you became more sensitive to these type of events after what happened on the Theodore Roosevelt? Yes. Um, yeah. And, and I say that because, you know, within that first conscious experience that I had with that entity in my room, um, that you know you have this feeling of like sleep paralysis uh right so that and that's why that's one of the subtitles of my book you know because that's involved um and in in having that experience i remember that i've had that experience a lot um but it was not something that something that i automatically connected with all of this you know I, I thought I, I thought, you know, as a kid and as a teenager, I thought, well, I'm just having these weird dreams where I wake up and I can't move, you know, um, or, you know, I'll, I'll, I, 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 there, there are all kinds of things that looking back on it, I can see that this, this has been happening my entire life. And I just, I didn't realize it until the age of 39, you know? And by that point, I was like a 39 year old male that was sleeping with the lights on because <laughs> I, I, I could not sleep in the dark if I slept at all, you know, because the dark was just, it was this place where reality just broke down, you know, and I could not, could not deal with that some nights. It was tough. Is it, is it still continuing for you, these nightly visits? Uh, no, not, not nightly. Um, the, what, what does, what has continued for me is this, uh, kind of consciousness that you come into afterwards. Um, and, uh, I, I know it sounds like, sounds like woo woo, but I, in, in writing this book, right. I, and, and the reason that I wrote this book <laughs> is because I felt this powerful urge that, that, Hey, you've got to write a book, right. About, about these experiences, because you understand something about them that a lot of people don't. Um, and so I, I thought to myself, you know, this kind of experience has always been a secret throughout the history of humanity. It's always been a secret. People don't talk about this, you know? So I thought, is, is this the right thing to do? Am I supposed to write a book about this experience and just be very blunt about it? And uh, one night I, I got my answer, um, uh, and the answer was yes. You know, uh, 
so so I wrote the book, um, and as I was writing the book, I would I, I experienced what uh, what some people would call waking clairvoyance. So you know you'll have dreams in which you'll be taught something, you'll be taught some concept, or told the name of an author, or something else that you can then wake up in the morning and Google and find it, <laughs> which was something that I thought was just amazing. Um, because I never, I never thought that kind of thing would be possible, but it is. Um, and so I, I would be given the names of authors to read and concepts and things like that. And I put all of those things in the book, um, because I knew that they, as I was writing it, this, this was happening. So it was like, you know, include these things. Um, and so that's what I did. Outstanding. Well, let me ask you this. Um, based on your experience with naval intelligence and all of that, how convinced are you that, that we've been withholding technology? Uh, withholding technology? I don't... Well, in other words, I, um, we've had a technology that we've had in our possession, alien technology, but we just haven't um, acknowledged, I guess. Yeah. You know, I, 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 I've been asked that before, and I... I, I'm I'm being totally honest with you, and I'm just saying I don't know. That's not me being uh, elusive in any way. Um, I if if we do have that kind of stuff, I was never read into that. I don't. So I know right. I know absolutely nothing about it. I can't. I don't know. Okay, it, I guess guess one question we got to ask is this: the footage that you saw in the Theodore Roosevelt of the Go Fast and the Gimbal. The length of it has always been a question within the UFO community. And I know that you and I and Tommy talked about it yesterday, mm -hmm. but what I want you to do is tell people that the length that you saw was what was released by the Pentagon. Yeah, that, that, that is absolutely true. Um, what I saw in a skiff in 2015 was the exact same clip. It was the same length, the same uh clarity uh i mean nothing nothing about it has changed um that was the original clip that i saw um and if there is more footage than that i i don't know you know i i i don't know who who even put that together on the ship um but but i but i know individuals who worked with people who put that stuff together so so I don't know if there was a longer clip. It wouldn't surprise me if there was, um, but I don't know. I and I, I I'm not sure how useful it would be to see more. You know. Okay. I mean, the other question I have for you is: What is the purpose of cryptography, uh, visualizing the clips? Ah, uh, um. So the way in which I came to be viewing these uh, clips. Like I said, I knew somebody that worked with the people who put this kind of thing together. And so that, that guy also worked in another part of Intel on the ship. Um, and so he worked in a different shop uh, than I did, a different space on the ship. So one day he uh, came walking into my shop, um, you know, and me and my guys were just sitting around waiting for our debrief because we were out doing workups and uh, we had finished our portion. So we were waiting to be debriefed uh, by our grader. Um, right. So we we're just kind of sitting around, you know, and he, he walked in and he came up to me and said, hey, pull this up, you know. So I he told me where it was. Uh, I went on the computer, logged in, pulled it up. And that that was that was the gimbal and go fast footage that he showed me. Um, yeah. So that's how you had access to that. I was wondering yeah. how that happened. Yeah. yeah. It, it wasn't, it, that, that wasn't like, uh, that wasn't like the kind of thing that typically would have come across my desk. Um, it, it might've been something that I would have known about or heard about or been in a brief and heard about, uh, but not necessarily something that I would have watched on my own. Um, and, and it would have been something that I would have known maybe just for 
you know, situational awareness, just to be aware of what's going on around the ship, because that was very much um, a part of my job, uh, constantly being aware of of what's happening, you know. Right. So we can confirm from you they're not part of our arsenal. They're not part of a foreign adversarial arsenal. The footage that was released by the Pentagon is the actual link that you witnessed on board the USS Theodore Roosevelt, correct? And, and clarity. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And clarity. Yes. Okay. So we confirmed that here on the UFO Man channel, <laughs> and that's a good thing. And we wanted to do that. Okay. Yeah. Um, Matthew, anything else you'd like to say about your situation or your book? <clears throat> Um, yeah. So, you know, the, one, one of the things that I realized about this whole, um, experience that they put me through, um, it's that, you know, th this experience is for all of us. Um, and a lot of people ask, well, why don't they just land on the white house lawn if they, if they want everybody to know, but, but the thing is that this, this change that happens in the psyche that allows you to connect with a universal consciousness uh, can only right. be, it can only be affected on an individual basis. Right. Right. So my advice to people is if you, if you want to do this, if you want to find this um, come autumn, you know, just sit down and meditate and ask for it and see what happens. That's what I did. Uh, and it, it'll either happen or it won't. Uh, but in my book, I have uh, a chapter on the kind of the psychology that will get you to that point, uh, because I kind of understand that a little bit more as well. That was one of the things that I was taught. Um, so, you know, try it, see what happens. Uh, okay. and I have to warn you, don't, this is not something to play around with. This isn't, right. this isn't going to be an experience that is going to be fun necessarily it's going to be an experience but it, it will be probably the most difficult thing you have ever done in your life so right if, if you're not ready for your life to be <laughs> turned upside down and upended um i would maybe th give give this some some thought right well we thank you for everything that you have shared with us tonight matthew we really appreciate you being here and uh, you have shared a lot of information that I think uh, our viewers really wanted to hear. So thank you very much. Thank you. Tommy, Thanks. any last comments? Matthew, thank you for coming. You were a wonderful guest. We really appreciate the stories. Uh, it was very enlightening. Thank you for being with us. Folks, thanks for coming out. Uh, as always, we really appreciate it. We hope we were entertaining tonight. Uh, I think we had a pretty good show. Again, just remember us on uh, Patreon. That would really help us out a lot because YouTube is a, a mess uh, and we're tired of trying to figure it out. So there's our Patreon link. Uh, if you could hit, hit that up for us, it really would help us a lot and uh, it'd give us uh, the ability to bring even better content and things like that in the future. Thank you. Yeah, that wasn't our link, but you can hit our link up on the main uh, UFO Man channel on YouTube. You'll see a, a join button up in the right-hand corner. Just click on that and check it out. Uh, there are three tiers, so um, you can check it out. If you don't want to, just wait the 30 days and see what happens. And most of the subscribe members should have their badges back by then. But uh, we're working on it. And uh, it's hard to work on something when you don't know what they want you to do. So uh, we're, we're doing the best we can. Can't and, fix it if uh, we don't know what's broken. That's the bottom line. And they're right. not telling us anything. And Matthew, we'd really like you to come back on the channel sometime and talk more about your your uh, book and uh, go deeper into it. And maybe we can bring Terry on and we can all join together and talk about it. Oh, Sound yeah, that'd good? be great. Yeah, any oh. anytime, just let me know. Okay, Thank well, you. all righty. Thank you for coming. <laughs> and to everyone uh out there in the chat room and everybody online participating thank you for coming this evening and from all of us on the panel good night and good evening <laughs>